I first met Brinley through the magic of television, being interviewed on the CBC. That summer day when I was 14, I didn't go swimming because I was drawn to the topic. Human rights for queer people like me. Brinley's charm and intelligence and wit were unforgettable. I seem to get these tomatoes on steroids. They were planted back there and they came all the way out here into the parking lot, which is really <laughs> nice. And I grew some hot cayennes and a lot of these uh, plants came from the uh, courtyard of the dicominiums. Years later, we were neighbors in the dicominiums where Brinley transformed a parking lot into a beautiful blooming garden. Do you want to get rid of the gum? Sure. <laughs> That's perfectly okay, Butler. <laughs> All righty. The beginning of it was uh, t t persecution, really. I, I got to Canada because uh, by the time uh, 1970 rolled around and uh, the, um, the police were what I call getting closer at the time, they kept on uh, escalating their arrests of me and every time I would, was involved in a political activity, um, I would be picked up on some suspicion of charge. I was arrested for suspicion of prostitution uh, because I gave a black man who wor worked in my department a ride home from work one night. I was searched and groped on the street, bent over my car while uh, Sherman, uh, the gentleman I was with, uh, had to watch this. My university days, um, I started uh, university in 1961. So I went to Butler University. Um, I was one of the four women scholarship students. My university days uh, quickly got involved in politics because I was um, asked to play my trumpet at a, um, a church that was working directly with street people and uh, um, single moms and prostitutes. And while I would go to the church to play my trumpet and make my <clears throat> five dollars, um, I would notice the programs that were going on. I got involved in their um, after school program, first this volunteer, and then they started to pay me. And all of the small town delusions of Crown Point, Indiana started to come to a head when I realized there was no give me your tired, you're poor. Um, that it was racism to the core, that housing and jobs and quality of life and education and women's rights, which there were none of, um, all had to do with race. Everything was race motivated, race driven, uh, racist cops, racist societies, uh, racist groups. Indiana still had a huge Klan population. Uh, it hadn't waned much uh, by 1961. So I got involved in the politic of the church. The spring of 1962, when I was in the last uh, semester of my first year, um, I discovered the Betty Keller Club. And um, Betty Keller's was a homosexual club. Uh, it's called a homo, homo club in the, in the day, back in the day. The Betty Keller Club not only had a real stage presence and lots of drag, but it was men and women, blacks and whites, Hispanics. It was anyone who wanted to be in a queer space that was safe. I was a music student. Uh, one of my closest friends was a drama student. Uh, he was the same size as I was. Um, I had all of my drag, which he called drag as well. It was always drag to me. I could wear his suits and ties and shirts and hats and they fit perfectly. So we decided to do up a little routine and make some money. Um, I was getting five bucks a week and it was barely enough to buy a martini and cigarettes. So I needed more money. I had to have more money. So I did drag and um, we used our own voices. We had to uh, play a background uh, record of the song we wanted to do, but the entire voiceover was our own. Richard and I, we, uh, we got these routines together and we did drag and some nasty little boy who didn't get a part that Richard had gotten uh, followed us to the Betty Keller Club one night and I guess he figured we were having too much fun because we were laughing all the time and he followed us there and um, took a picture of us doing drag, went back to the university took it to the Dean of Men and Women the Dean of Women called me in and told me my scholarship was over my university was over at the end of the year and that uh, 
I would not be allowed to stay out the rest of the term because I was a danger to incoming freshman girls. In the fall of 1962, I had decided to go to Indiana University. I tried to get my grades transferred from Butler and discovered that there was no record of my being there. But I'm happy to say that in my notes, uh, as I'm going through my things and looking through my things, I found my original certificate to, for the scholarship to Butler University, as well as the letter of acceptance. And it was dated September 1961. So I found that kind of sweet that uh, as hard as they tried to invalidate me and erase me, I exist. That kind of activity, that kind of uh, oppressive sort of politic. Um, at that time, I was an angry young woman, number one, so I would fight back. And uh, fighting back meant uh, being in the civil rights movement, showing up at demonstrations when you were one of four whites who would uh, show up in a black neighborhood and uh, be photographed by the FBI. And uh, that started early because of the church work and the street work and the injustices that I was seeing over and over again. And eventually it got to the point where I was known as an end lover by the Indianapolis police. They uh, followed me around and then when they discovered I was queer as well, uh, these arrests became more frequent. They followed me to a party. They arrested 96 people. We were scared shitless because it was the police after all and we were thrown in the lockup with the murderers. Uh, they wanted us to I guess learn a lesson, but they didn't know that we had a bottle of scotch with us. <laughs> so we were able to get through the night okay, you might say. Uh, I became visible. I was tall, I had a great job, I had red hair, it was getting longer by the minute, and I stood out and I'd go to a demonstration and the next thing you know, I'd be followed by the police and they'd arrest me for some bogus Victorian law. Um, I guess my mini skirt was too short, I don't know but it was just something to harass me and put fear in me. I was paranoid by the time I left there. I had to get out of there. The, uh, the killing of the students at Kent State was the last straw. One of my neighbors, uh, another working girl who lived across the street, told me one night it was the police in a marked car that had actually shot out my living room window. I was sitting on the couch at the time in the dark watching television. From that day on, I went and bought a rifle, and I slept with the rifle until I moved here virtually. Um, completely paranoid by then and ready to get out. So I did. I came to Toronto. I didn't know a soul. And I moved here on August 3rd in 1970, and here it is. Courage is my favorite painting by my friend Brindley. A tulip struggling to lift itself out of the snow spoke to me. Truth, beauty, art. Life can bloom even under the harshest conditions. Brinley's paintings told my story too. You gotta come out. Mm -hmm. It's something that just, you gotta have passion for the subject. And then you get the inspiration from your own passion, I think. <clears throat> and then there's a pull or a demand. It's like getting the word down on paper. Um, you just have to do it. Sometimes it comes out great and sometimes it doesn't, but the point is the passion is still in it even if it's, uh, you know, not quite the way you would want the painting to be, but the passion is there for the subject anyway. And even in the florals you can feel that, you know, if you see a flower in a certain setting and the light hits it a certain way, even if it's at night and the moonlight hits it a certain way, it just, you know, oh my God, it just it's like a spark. And so your mind just kind of keeps it until you can get it down, and then it just dissipates. Mm -hmm. But you have the painting left, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Okay, cool. Space Pony is just one of those wonderful pieces that came out of wood. I used to make a lot of constructions like this, and basically, um, it's just a fantasy kind of cut out. They use little glass pieces for eyes. A little soft spot on the horse's nose is made out of leather. And then I found all these magical bits of whatever they are, some kind of plastic. But I thought they'd make a perfect tail coming out of its little copper pipe. <laughs> just a little piece of contemporary folk art. I um, always like the uh, folk art because uh, folk art is art by folks. Just like me, like 
-hmm. some folk who made something really. This is actually my aunt. And this is me and my brother and my cousin. And uh, this is the Baron Bleak's homestead from uh, rural Indiana where I grew up. And basically I painted it because my aunt was a city girl and she hated the country and she was stuck out there with a bunch of kids, us three, two of her own. And I wanted it to look bleak like Bruegel. Bleak like Bruegel. Uh, <laughs> here we go. For her, it was a little show called Tarts and Hearts. Basically, I wanted to show different uh, depictions of sexy little tarts and their transgendered folks. And this one here is like, don't die wondering, number two. Is it two men? Is it a man and a woman? Is it two women? That kind of thing. And the same with uh, some of the characters here in the uh, paintings. I wanted them to look uh, as though they could be either sex or whatever sex they wanted to be. And I left it up to the viewer to determine that. Um, basically, it was just a way of, of showing the theme and trying to get in the message that, you know, sometimes everything isn't always what it appears to be. And when you really look at something, the gender, the first thing you see or not. And in my view, it's not. You see the person and then the gender comes out after. And that's what I wanted these things to show that here are people or not, you know, like this little tart up here. She's got a tattoo of mom on her thigh and she's kind of floating on this big heart, sort of like a uh, pond lily. She's the pond lily and those are the lily pads. And I just thought it was quite hot. And Susan was um, my lover for years. This painting was really difficult for me in some ways, but it came very easily when I started it. Basically, it's a series of triangles. They're in her hair and in her jawline, in her nose. And it shows a really good likeness, not only of her, but of um, the inner Susan. And I think it shows kind of the sad, but also the beauty. Well, this little sweetie is one of my uh, sexy little paintings. It's called Ringed Goddess. But this is a small painting from a series I did uh, around going to Port Dover. On a Friday the 13th, 50,000 will show up, and it's sort of like Gay Pride Day for bikers. You see absolutely every kind of drag and costume and bike and setup. I love the motorcycle myself. Uh, it's a real passion for me, and I hope I can do it until I croak. And it's basically the peace of mind it gives you. It is kind of zen in its solitude, but it also keeps you very keen and close to your life force because you have to be so aware it's only two wheels holding up your life. So it's something that I find uh, really stimulating and it keeps me sharp and I just love it. That's another little biker painting of uh, lesbianic women and it's really kind of fun because I took this trip from uh, Chicago, downtown Chicago, to, uh, did all of Route 66 to California, and uh, on the way I met some really interesting women traveling, and um, some of them very sexy and very provocative, and it was your typical thing, I'm going to flat with my thong on and my chaps so you can see my ass. I entitled this painting First Ride because, well, it's a double entendre for one thing, but uh, for another thing, it was just the... Uh, little magic that these women have. My dad had a picture of the Marilyn Monroe calendar on the back of our basement door. Marilyn was fully nude, reclined on a, uh, on like a red satin. Oh, it was the big thing of the day. And it wasn't just that that attracted me to Marilyn. It was also involves um, a prostitute I knew in uh, the early days in Indianapolis. Incredible woman. He had a friend who Marilyn used to stay with in California periodically and her friend was really butchy. One time she showed me this picture and it was of her friend and, and Marilyn Monroe and I just looked at it and said, oh my God, she looks like a dyke. Could that be? And I think Marilyn probably had lots of secrets in her life, but uh, it's funny when you grow up in that era and she was an icon, it stays with you in a way because there's so much beauty and yet pathos in the personality of Marilyn Monroe and I've always just loved her.
Butler. Hey, Brindley. Brindley Butler. Butler. Brindley. Good morning. Good morning. Here we are at Allen Gardens. Yeah. The beautiful. What do you like about Allen Gardens? Oh, I love the serenity of it. I love the fact that street people can sleep in the park. Uh, I love the flowers and the fragrance. and It just wakes you up in the spring. It was beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's one of my favorite places in the city. And uh, I didn't like some of the changes it went through. You know, they cut down all the uh, the big shrubs so uh, gay boys couldn't have sex in the park or working girls couldn't have sex in the park. But I think that didn't enhance anything. I think if people want to have sex in public, they're just going to do it. And. Uh, as long as it's not in front of kids and it doesn't hurt anybody, I don't care. I think it's kind of great. I remember the first time I had sex outdoors. It was an Indiana blizzard, actually, and I didn't seem to notice the snow getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> and then I'll censor it from there. <laughs> sexy Lita and the sexy swan. <laughs> Isn't that a sexy bugger? <laughs> mm -hmm. Anthurium erectus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Do you know how a lesbian identifies an orchid? Oh. She starts salivating. <laughs> Sorry, I got how I got into politics actually because it wasn't until I was around 38 years old that I was uh, looking into my 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica and out fell this campaign card. And I'd never seen it before. I didn't even know it was in there. And uh, it was a bookmark that my grandmother had left when she was looking up Zoroasterism. And I happened to be looking it up too because, you know, 2001, a space odyssey. So there came the card, and I looked at it, and I said, gee, I remember as a kid somebody saying something about grandma being in the government, but it didn't mean anything, and I didn't even know what that meant, really, because she, um, she died when I was seven. So my recollections of her were mostly comfort recollections, actually. But anyhow, so I'm looking at the card, and the card says, Minna Kathleen Bridley, um, candidate for city clerk Whiting, Indiana. But great, oh my God, she must have won because that's what my memory was. So it started to make me think about the political life that I'd come from uh, because my dad was very political. And uh, you know, and I, this, the date on that card was 1929 and I was so happy to see that it had a little union made label on it. You know, they used to print that all the time, uh, Union Made, on, on any kind of literature that was actually uh, printed during, I'd say, the 20s, 30s, up to the 60s, perhaps. And still, in some cases now, but not as much as it used to be. It used to be like a symbol of pride that it was Union Made. And um, it got me to thinking back on stories about her. One of the stories was that she, during the beginning of the Depression, she had a pie wagon. And in those days, people walked the neighborhoods of their cities and towns and did whatever they could. They sold whatever they could sell. That's how a lot of people made money in rag picking and recycling and doing all kinds of things. And uh, even though she died when I was seven, I remember the pies because the baking was just so amazing. So I figured that everybody knew her. She had been around all the hoods. She was selling pies. The pies were fabulous. So she just went around on her route and campaigned as she was working. And um, I thought it was kind of ingenious in a way because she got elected. And as it turns out, she was the first woman in the, uh, for the Democratic Party in the Indiana State Legislature. So that made me feel so proud. Uh, my dad was always political. He always talked about political issues, about union organizing. I remember from the age of about 13 on, he was uh, secretary treasurer of his union. The reason I remember this is because it was the first time I'd ever smelled a mimeograph machine. 
and we would be cranking out the newsletter on the dining room table and sniffing this stuff and it was like, ooh, is this interesting? And it made uh, stuffing envelopes, tearing union dues tickets and doing all that um, a lot more interesting, shall we say. So I started reading the newsletters and uh, oh my God, there was all kinds of stuff about race in them. And uh, part of it was uh, the whole concept of organizing uh, around Hispanic and black workers because the unions in the 30s and 40s, I mean, they killed people in riots over issues that were unbelievable and one of them was race and the fact that a black or a Hispanic couldn't get into this union because they couldn't get a job. Some members believe that, oh, well, it's okay to hire them but don't let them join our union because we'll have to sit in the same room with them. So my father was writing this scathing material in these, in these little newsletters. By the time I was 14, I remember uh, in Little Crown Point, Indiana, there was a drive-by and uh, basically what happened was after the last um, initial push to get the unions opened up and he was campaigning heavily for this and all his carpool buddies were telling him he was crazy and everybody was telling him he was crazy, um, this old uh, Studebaker truck came driving by our house and just splayed the front of it with shotgun shells. So that made me stand up and think, geez, I was only 14 and I wasn't that bright at the time, but you started to think, gee, this is kind of dangerous work and uh, he's willing to do it and he's got a family and he's got a, you know, a new wife and things like that and yet he was just adamant about pursuing this this vision of his which was to bring all these people uh, into the union. It was a really good education for me but you know when you're 14 and all your home hormones are raging and you've already got a girlfriend and you're preoccupied with young love and whatever you know the union stuff was there but it wasn't my primary focus. My primary focus was back basically practicing my trumpet and seeing my girlfriend, whether I was allowed to or not. Now that they're all gone, I can safely say I know how to climb a rose trellis with no problem. When you're in a small town and you have a pass law and no blacks can stay there after six o'clock at night, you know that you have other sentiments that are pretty hateful as well. So we were definitely in the minority in our thinking. So. I remember getting in trouble from the U.S. history teacher that he had his own look on the Holocaust. Um, and then I reported him to the uh, superintendent of schools and my principal because he was uh, basically a zundel. He was a Holocaust denier. From then on, the guy really didn't like me. And uh, he tried to get me expelled, actually, because I had a Kennedy button on and that I wore to school. And at the time, no one wore a political anything. You did not wear a political button to school. Um, I mean, you couldn't even wear pants if you were a girl, so a political button was completely out of the picture. And after about a four-year um, streak of bliss, that my girlfriend was for Nixon. Well, talk about the first major fight in paradise. Um, it just stopped everything cold and uh, I started thinking and uh, thinking always brings me back to education and how important it was stressed in our family to get an education and part of that was educating yourself around race around sexuality I know in our family library we had books by Natalie Barney and Gertrude Stein and Henry Miller and you know George Groves and people that were banned everywhere including our local library, but yet these books were in my home. So of course I read them all and, you know, they were inspiration for early hormone activity, I'll say. Um, but nevertheless, education was always stressed and it wasn't so much about that if you're educated and you go to university and you do this and you do that, then you're smarter. It wasn't about that. It wasn't about being right. It wasn't about being smart. Education was always about asking questions. Get a little bit of knowledge, find out a little bit more, get as many sides as you can, and make up your own mind. That way you can have intelligent differences without wanting to kill each other.
But by that time, and having read it, you know, I used to think that all the lesbians lived in France and Europe because I certainly wasn't reading about them in Nancy Drew, if you know what I mean. Um, so I had visions of all this going on in another part of the world, you know. Myself was somehow connected to all this. I knew that I was basically a lesbian, but I, I didn't have a way to articulate it because I thought all the other ones didn't live in the States, they lived in Europe. So I didn't have anyone really to talk to about it except my father. And amazingly enough, his response was that society would give me a hard time, but that as far as he was concerned, love was such a precious commodity that any love was better than no love. So he kind of made me feel good about being who I was, even though I was the only lesbian in North America. Uh, it was okay. Um, I didn't know about all the North American authors at the time because of what our selection was, but that was a politic in itself. Sexuality was a politic as well. And I was proud of my sexuality because in our house, what his word was, went. And if he's telling me it's okay to be queer, I'm delighted. I think it's great. So I start to feel great. So I start to get a little bit more open. And that's when the shit hit the fan. I always felt trapped in this place where I grew up. And it was a big extended family ca catastrophe, shall we say. And I remember one time crying really hard. And it might have been when she passed away. I was only seven. But I found comfort in the earth, and it's really hard to explain, but it used to come to me all the time in a dream, and I'd go out running outside, and I'd lay flat on the earth, you know, face down, kind of, and I could just, I'd reach my hands out, and I'd grab a hold of the grass, and I'd just lay there and cry, and cry, and cry. And after a little while, I'd feel this warmth come up out of the earth, and it always seemed to envelop me in, in like arms. And I'd get so much comfort from it that every time I felt this enormous stress and lots of despair uh, in my early years, uh, I'd go outside and I'd lay on the earth and I didn't know it was the mother then, I didn't know anything about it, I just knew that it was a real comfort for me. Um, if you felt this despair, you could go out and find a park somewhere, your backyard, any place you could find, and just sit on the earth and lie back, and, and all of that love would come up through the ground, and it would envelop you with this amazing hug. And I still feel that, and it's that's one reason why I love Ellen Garden so much. From the moment she was diagnosed with cancer, Brinley was determined to die enlightened. Nine months later, surrounded by loving friends, Brinley died with a beautiful smile on her handsome face. But that's what it's about. It's about uh, the spirit leaving the body and, you know, there's a big trumpet in it like and I have to define that more clearly. The wings are forming. Mm -hmm. It's like a big chrysalis. I had a vision in my dream the other night that uh, when I die, I'm gonna grow wings. <laughs>